Okay, so let's get started. So uh, last time we were discussing the properties of the Rankine Hugonio curve. Uh, and based on where the where a Rayleigh line intersects uh, with uh, the tangent point to the to the uh, to the uh, to the product Hugonio, uh, we could divide uh, the potential uh, uh, regimes of combustion into five regimes. Well, really four, uh, where we have this upper branch here. This is called a strong detonation. Uh, this here is called a weak detonation. Uh, where the flow is uh, is supersonic uh, 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 behind the combustion wave, the flow for a strong detonation is subsonic. <clears throat> Here we have uh, a weak deflagration where the flow is uh, subsonic, and we have a, a strong deflagration where the flow is supersonic uh, 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 in the product region uh, behind the stationary wave. And these special points here uh, that basically demark the strong and weak detonation uh, is they are called the Chapman Drew, the Chapman Drugay points. And so for the detonation branch, there is a Chapman Drugay detonation point, and there's a Chapman Drugay uh, flame point. And there's also a fifth region here, and that's forbidden because if you were to compute the mass flux uh, based on the Rayleigh line, uh, you would have a complex value mass flux, which makes no sense. And so we were just discussing the properties of detonations, and basically it was just sort of going through this stuff and for the detonation branch, uh, we could prove that for a strong detonation, the flow is uh, uh, the uh, 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 the flow. If we have a flow going into a stationary detonation, and products are here, the flow is subsonic. So if we have some sort of expansion wave or speaker, uh, we can sing to the detonation in the products, and the detonation can hear us. Uh, which means that things uh, uh, that things downstream of the detonation can affect the can affect the detonation. Um, okay, and hence, uh, strong detonations are not stable. Any expansion wave can propagate to the shock uh, and weaken it, uh, which will then slow down the detonation. Okay, and so, which because uh, due to a variety of process, that will make more sense. Uh, this will make more sense after we discuss the structure. And now, the products of a weak detonation are supersonic. So that means the speaker, if it's a if it's a weak detonation, the speaker. Uh, the acoustic waves cannot make it to this detonation because the flow uh, behind the detonation is supersonic. And if we have a Chetman Jugay detonation, the flow is exactly sonic and the speakers still can't uh, send acoustic waves uh, 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 from the downstream to the primary detonation front, <clears throat> meaning that for a Chetman Jugay detonation, the shock and the reaction zone are completely isolated. That is, they have no communication to the outside world, and so that is uh, that's that that's part of why, as I said before, a detonation is very stable after it, it forms. It's uh, it's it's completely isolated. Uh, you have a very very narrow window of time to be able to uh, suppress it if it's an explosion scenario. Um, it was a uh, I took combustion from an experimentalist, and he always joked that detonations always form uh, when you don't want them to form. And then when you do want them to form as in a detonation engine, they're impossible to ignite. So um, as just, I, I guess that's a, a consequence of Murphy's law, uh, but <clears throat> that's it. So also, as I said before, uh, the fact that you have a supersonic flow coming into the shock wave, you have a shock wave, so the flow is supersonic. Uh, you have a heat release process and after that heat release process, you magically have supersonic flow uh, behind the shock. Uh, for those of you in gas dynamics who've studied Rayleigh flow, you know that that is not, uh, in most cases, that's not realistic. So that's unphysical, unless you have a very, very special case. Um, and uh, and after we discuss the structure, you'll be you'll you'll be able to make sense of how we can accelerate the flow uh, to supersonic conditions. Okay, and all detonations are supersonic with respect to the wave, because uh, after we discuss the structure, you will realize that the front portion of a detonation is a shock wave. And so that means all detonations with respect to the flow uh, propagate supersonically. Okay, and we went over basic properties. And I remember discussing that detonations produce massive changes uh, in pressure up to 10 to the fifth uh, for solids. 
Uh, and yes, they produced gigantic pressures. Okay. And then now we were going to start discussing the, uh, the deflagration branch. So here we have uh, the frozen hugonio or, or the reactant hugonio. And here we have the equilibrium hugonio or the product hugonio, uh, whatever you want to call it. And we have the same limiting Rayleigh lines. We have a green one where there is no solution. So that means it's an unphysical system. Uh, you, you will not have a stable combustion wave. Uh, we have the chapman jagay rayleigh line where the Rayleigh line is tangent uh, uh, to the product Hugonio. And we have uh, this blue Rayleigh line where there are multiple uh, solutions and similar to the detonations, there is a weak deflagration and a strong deflagration. And again, based on the slopes uh, of, the, of the Hugonio and the Rayleigh line uh, at, these, uh, uh, at these two intersection points here, we can use Juguet's rule, and you can show. Uh, I'm I'm not going to go through the argument. It's the exact same uh, thing that we did for the uh, detonation branch. Uh, is that the products are subsonic for a weak deflagration, um, and so almost all deflagrations uh, are weak. Okay, and so that sort of um, uh, thing that's different about flames is that. Uh, a Chapman Jagay flame is actually extremely unstable. Uh, and there's a reason for that that we'll discuss uh, probably at the very last week of class when we discuss explosion processes. Um, and so most deflagrations actually live right around here. Uh, basically, a very, very slight um, uh, um, uh, uh, decrease uh, in pressure, and they almost never. Uh, gravitate towards the CJ deflagration uh, speed. Okay, and so that's just the way they are. And so, actually, solving for how fast a flame propagates is more difficult than solving for how fast a detonation propagates. Because uh, for a detonation to propagate, uh, there is only one physical stable point, and that's the CJ point. And uh, uh, and you can solve that from just raw thermodynamics. Uh, a flame does not live at the CJ point; it lives above the CJ point. And so that becomes a much more challenging eigenvalue problem, where to find how fast the flame goes, you need to know the structure, which means you need to know the chemical kinetics and you need to know the molecular transport properties. And so that's part of why we spent so much time going over a molecular transport, because that's because that's very important for uh, uh, to determine the properties of flames. Uh, and 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 without heat conduction, you don't have a flame. Period. <clears throat> okay. Um, and again, a strong deflagrations, you can show that products are supersonic. Uh, and the CJ deflagration, if we look back at, at our diagram, um, it is, it has uh, the Rayleigh line with the largest slope uh, that produces a valid solution uh, to, our, uh, to, uh, to our system. So a CJ deflagration is the fastest possible a flame that you could possibly have. Okay, and so that's the exact opposite of a detonation where a CJ detonation is the slowest possible detonation. Um, thankfully, that it is the, that it's also the stable detonation. Uh, I would it would be explosions would be far worse if the stable detonation was much faster uh, th than that because because the shock and and then the pressurized term it would be would be much much stronger, and also. Uh, because most deflagrations live in this very narrow region right here, um, this branch of the Higonio has not been studied very much. Uh, in fact, there's only really one context that you need to worry about a CJ deflagration, and that's for initiation of unwanted uh, explosions, like in a coal mine or something like that, which happened to be one of my areas of research, so we will uh, be discussing those. So that is really interesting. Uh, the CJ flames um, again, they're almost never discussed, uh, but they are pretty interesting and they're very unstable. Um, uh, and they don't, and you don't, if you have a CJ flame, uh, a, a, a scenario that's producing a CJ flame, you will wind up with a detonation sooner or later. Uh, that's just, a, it's almost a, a sort of hard fact. Okay. And so the speed of a flame is called S sub L. 
that's a laminar flame speed, or in the context of propellants, or RB, that's the propellant burning rate. And that's the same burning rate uh, when we discussed the interfacial boundary conditions that I drew that RB going down. Uh, that's actually what that is. That's where I got that from, uh, is that basically when you, do, when you deal with propellants, you deal with a receding interface, and that interface is moving down at some regression rate RB. Okay. And so uh, S sub L uh, in our flow diagram is equal to U1. And for propellants, it can be on the order of a centimeter per second on the upper limit, um, usually on the order of a millimeter per second, something like that, uh, for say nitromethane. Uh, and then for hydrogen oxygen, uh, you could have a laminar flame speed of 10 meters per second. So these things are very, 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 very slow uh, compared to a detonation, which was, at, which was at least two orders of magnitude higher, if not three or four. Okay. And so, uh, and so that's a characteristic of that. And just based on where a flame lives on the, on the Higonio, is that basically we are right here. Uh, is that there's a very slight pressure, a very slight pressure decrease. And so, and again, in my diagram, I way exaggerated the, way exaggerated the decrease in pressure. It's actually far less than this because uh, the product Hugonio is far more flat than I've drawn here. Uh, but I don't have an iPad wide enough to make, uh, to draw to scale. So the decrease in pressure is only about 0.98 to 0.99 for most flames. So it's very, 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 very slight. And this is due to the expansion of the products. And you can tell um, the reason that that is, is because again, if we look at the, on the PV diagram, you'll see that for a flame, they you produce a massive expansion of the products. Uh, up to about a factor of a thousand if you have a propellant burning under under normal normal atmospheric uh, conditions and about 0.05 to 0.25 for gases. Okay, and so you have this massive uh, um, um, uh, expansion of the product gases, uh, whereas for a detonation you uh, for a detonation you had a fairly mild compression. Okay, uh, but at a, but at extremely high pressure. In the case of solids, but even though gas explosions don't get to nearly that high of a pressure, they only increase the pressure by a factor of twenty-ish. Uh, they still can produce massive damage. Um, it's just the characteristics of that damage are different, and I might discuss some of that stuff when we get to uh, explosion or explosions. Like um, you'll see pictures in coal mine explosions where a giant steel door about that thick was just ripped off the hinges and then tossed to the other side of a room. Uh, a high explosive would not produce that kind of a damage. Uh, a high explosive would shatter the door. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas the, the explosion produced in a coal mine, the pressure rise was only probably about a factor of three, but it was there for such a long time and you had that entire factor of three pressurized acting on the entirety of that door. And so the hinges couldn't take that. Whereas for high explosive, that peak pressure of say over a gigapascal is very localized. So you punch a hole in the door and shatter it rather than throw it off the hinges. And so, uh, and so uh, the damage is actually quite different um, for gas detonations uh, and, uh, and a high explosive detonation. Okay, and then um, I'm, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but for an ideal gas with constant coefficients, uh, you can define the ideal gas law like this, where P is equal to gamma minus one rho E plus, uh, uh, plus, this, uh, plus this rho QP, or, or, or rho QYP, where this is the, Q is the mass heat of reaction for a single step global reaction of reactant SCOTA products blah 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 and if you scroll down um you can show by basically finding the tangent points to the to the Rayleigh line using this equation of state for the internal energy which is the only portion of the equation of state that you need to solve this uh 
you can um uh you 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 uh, uh you can apply the um uh apply the sonic and apply the sonic condition and the tangency condition uh uh for the Rayleigh line in the product Hugonio. And you can show that either the uh, Chapman Jagay detonation velocity or the Chapman Jagay flame speed. So I should probably make a little note here that DCJ equals debt velocity at CJ and FCJ equals flame velocity at the CJ point. Okay, that's just tradition. I don't know why one's called D and the other's S. It, they just are. Um, but anyways, for the simple case of a constant coefficient ideal gas, you can show that the that the detonation or Chapman Jagay of uh, a flame speed velocity is given by this expression here, uh, where C1 squared is the speed of sound squared. So C1 equals square root of gamma P over one. Okay. And so uh, you can apply this, uh, you'll find that there's actually multiple roots and the plus root gives you the detonation velocity and the minus root gives you the, uh, uh, the Chapman Jagay flame speed. Okay. And then you can also show um, that, the, that the change of density, pressure and velocity uh, and the Mach number uh, for, the, for, for the flow after the combustion wave uh, can be given by these expressions here. And again, I'm not going to derive them. Um, they they make fairly nice homework problems, so that's probably what I'll do with them. Okay, so are there any questions on this? Okay, so I'll draw just a real quick PV diagram. Just to show where I'll, along the Hugonio, uh, where the uh, where the sort of stable solutions are. So we have our reactant Hugonio here, and we have our product Hugonio here. But I'm not going to draw the entire product Hugonio. So for detonations, we have one stable point usually, that's a CJ point, and any detonation that is strong tends to decay down to uh, uh, basically down uh, down to the CJ point unless you're forcing it. Uh, you, you can force a strong detonation, uh, but you have to keep forcing it. And this portion here uh, is uh, forbidden by by basically gas dynamics um, unless for unless there are very special uh, set of cases that uh, uh, that you can. Do so. Just draw this much more faintly. P one, P two. And for the flames, where a flame tends to live, is actually right here in this. Oops, I got to shift that up a little bit. Flames tend to live right about here. In this very narrow region here, and the CJ point is right here. And the CJ point, I'll draw that as an open circle because that is not stable. And this region here is not is not physical. This is where most flames live. Okay, and so it's actually uh, because most flames live in this region over here, they are not at the CJ point, so you cannot apply the tan that extra tangency condition, you, or you cannot apply the sonic condition uh, to find the flame speed. And so that is the so finding the flame speed, as I said before, becomes a much more challenging. It's called it, it's it's called an eigenvalue problem, in the sense that you need to that to compute the flame speed you need is that you need to compute the structure of the flame but to compute the structure of the flame you need to know how fast the flame is going and so it becomes this really complicated it becomes this really complicated uh iterative process uh, to find how fast a flame goes because you need to consider the structure 
uh, and it takes a very long time to run those uh, 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 calculations. But thankfully, uh, Cantera will do that for you. It will automatically do that. Uh, the solver may be finicky, uh, but uh, 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 but Cantera can do that for you, at, at least for ideal gases. Okay, so are there any questions with this stuff? Okay. Professor, what do you mean when it's not physical? Like it physically cannot exist? Yes. Um, if you recall, if you have flow in a duct, and I have subsonic flow, so that is U is less than C, and I have heat release. Uh, you can show, at least uh, from a gas dynamic standpoint, that the maximum speed is U equals the sound speed after the heat release process. Is that via heat release, you cannot accelerate the flow. Uh, you cannot accelerate the flow to U is greater than the speed of sound, not physical. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so I don't know if you've, you if you've had gas dynamics uh, or not before, but uh, that is a that that is not physical. Um, you cannot spontaneously, uh, without doing something special, by just heat release alone in, in a constant area duct, you cannot accelerate a flow to supersonic conditions. Um, now, if you uh, uh, if you now you may think, well, if I have a supersonic flow. Uh, can I keep accelerating the flow by adding heat release? Well, the exact opposite is true. If the flow is supersonic uh, coming in, what will happen is the heat release will actually slow the flow down uh, until the flow becomes sonic. <laughs> and so uh, even then you can't, uh, you can't accelerate the flow uh, beyond the sonic condition just by heat release uh, alone. And so the sort of sonic point becomes uh, this sort of attractor and there are and there are also second law reasons why you can't do that, okay? Which is probably the real underlying principle as to why you can't. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, and I guess in terms of gas dynamics, uh, for those of you who have had that, uh, our uh, combustion wave is nothing more than flow in a constant area duct with heat release. Uh, so you can actually think of it like that in terms of its bulk properties. Uh, and in fact, uh, when we start discussing detonation structure, uh, the structure behind the lead shock of a detonation is, is really nothing more than a Rayleigh flow, where the Rayleigh flow, uh, where the heat release for, for, for the Rayleigh flow is given by a, a chemical reaction. That's it. And so if you put it into that context, and if, for those of you who've had that uh, type of class, material before uh, uh, that will sort of make sense to you. Okay, so if there are no more questions on this, I'm gonna move on to the next set of slides. And that is, how do we find the structure of a detonation? So now say we wanna find the structure of a detonation because there's a lot of information you can learn by studying the structure, the, uh, uh, the actual structure of a detonation. And unfortunately, the ranking hedonio, that's those aren't my initials, that's ranking hedonio, uh, only told us the bulk properties of the wave, that is how fast it goes, and basically what are the properties before and after the wave. That's all ranking hedonio can tell us. It can tell us nothing more. However, for a detonation, there was a, uh, a very successful model uh, proposed by uh, three people almost simultaneously. Uh, Zeldovich, who's a very, very famous Russian combustion scientist. Uh, if you work in combustion for uh, a mild period of time, you will come across his name about 17 million times. Uh, von Neumann, an American physicist, um, and Doring, uh, a, German, uh, a, a German physicist, and they all came up with this model uh, basically roughly independently at the same time, because they were all on separate sides of a war. <clears throat> Okay, and so it's so basically it's given the Z and D model. Okay, and so what they what they basically realized is that if you look at the 
um, if you look at if you consider the uh, uh, if you consider the uh, the PV diagram, and you consider the fact that the detonation branch lived up here, uh, you can prove that due to the slope of this Rayleigh line, uh, and uh, that you can prove that the um, uh, uh, that the combustion wave with respect to the reactants is supersonic. Okay, so and they produce. So basically, the Mach number of a detonation wave is uh, is supersonic. That means it's greater than one, and it produces a, a massive increase uh, in pressure. So the heat release is producing a positive pressure disturbance to the flow and a massive uh, positive pressure disturbance to the flow, and it's moving supersonic. And so, what is the only combustion, or basically, what is the only gas dynamic wave? That moves supersonically and produces a massive increase in pressure. That's a shock. A shock is a shock wave is the only answer to that question. Okay. And so what they and so basically what they realized is that if if you want to understand the uh, if you want to understand the structure of a of of a det of a, of a Chapman Drouet detonation or any other detonation for that matter, is that is that is that basically whatever happens in the chemical uh, reaction uh, process uh, for all cases, basically no matter what happens after the shock, uh, the lead structure of a detonation wave is always a shock wave, always. Okay. And so now what ignites, oops, boomer moment. Um, and so what ignites the, uh, so what and so what so you may think if I have gases sitting around, how do they reach a temperature to where uh, to uh, to a rapid chemical a rapid chemical reaction uh, can start, and that is due to shock compression. Uh, is that these shocks are so strong that the shock compression alone compresses and heats the reactants to the point to where they start to react rapidly. So shock compression alone in a detonation is what heats the reactants. Uh, heat conduction and, uh, and mass diffusion play a very, very, very little role. Uh, in multidimensional detonations, there's some debate as to whether they play a role uh, under certain special uh, conditions, but I won't be discussing those in this class. So, uh, and so, <clears throat> and then also, they noted that the only stable detonation is a CJ detonation where the flow is sub or where the flow is sonic. That is, it is at the speed of sound. And so note that behind a shock, if we have a shock wave here. So here's the detonation structure. We have our shock wave right here. We're starting at some pressure P naught or P1, I should say, to be consistent with the nomenclature that I used be, uh, before. Well, the is that the reactants are going to be they are going to be uh, uh, compressed and heated by the shock wave, then the pressure is going to jump way up, and then what's going to happen is then we're going to start to induce chemical reaction, and we're going to release heat, and what uh, and basically the flow behind all stationary shocks is subsonic. Okay, and the flow in front of the shock is always sub uh, is always supersonic. Okay, and so now in the subsonic region behind the shock, uh, we are we are adding heat due to chemical reaction, and so <clears throat> uh, basically the heat addition to subsonic flow accelerates it, uh, and as you accelerate the flow, uh, you are going to decrease the pressure, and so as this keeps going on. Uh, we would expect a structure to look something a bit like what I have drawn here. Is that a uh, all chemical uh, since uh, since at the product Hugonio we are exactly uh, at we are exactly at the equilibrium state. That is at the product Hugonio there are no more chemical reactions that they are all gone, no more. Okay, and so if we consider their Z and D structure. Where basically you have a shock wave and a combustion process behind that shock wave uh, 
that is accelerating the flow with respect to the shock uh, to uh, uh, basically to uh, 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 up to the sonic point. Um, what we have here is a structure that basically looks like uh, basically it basically looks like a sort of anvil like structure. And so uh, what we have is we have like I'll just follow pressure. We have uh, we have uh, we have uh, the pressure in the reactants here. Uh, they get uh, 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 you get a massive increase of pressure due to uh, the shock wave. Then after the chemical, uh, then after the chem uh, the chemical reactions become rapid, the the flow behind the shock wave starts to accelerate up to the point to where uh, the reactions terminate, and they terminate uh, at the uh, at the point where the uh, where the flow is sonic with respect to the shock. Okay, and this and this heat addition process process accelerates the flow. Uh, and then if you look at temperature, you would have that the that the temperature would look something like this. You'd have the temperature of the reactants here uh, due to shock compression. The temperature jumps up to here, uh, but it's not quite at the full temperature yet because we need to is that we need to add some heat to it. And so so due to the due to the energy added by chemical reaction. Uh, the temperature will basically slowly increase up to the point to where it's perfectly flat uh, at the Chetna uh, uh point. And so I'll call these TCJ, PCJ. And then the Mach number would look something like this. So here is the Mach equals one line is that we have supersonic flow uh, coming into the shock wave. Uh, behind the shock wave, it is subsonic or less than one. And then due to acceleration from the heat addition process, uh, that the flow becomes uh, that the Mach number becomes exactly one uh, 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 at the end of the detonation wave. Okay, and so you can sort of kind of heuristically sketch this process uh, on uh, on the PV diagram using a ranking Huygenio uh, analysis. And at any point in this detonation wave structure. The mass flux has to be constant, and that's a and that's a conservation of mass uh, consideration that will be that uh, that will be discussing uh, a bit later. So basically, all of these points, even though they don't uh, they don't all lie on the same Hugonio, they all lie on the exact same Rayleigh line. All of them, all of them, they lie on the same Rayleigh line. Okay, because the mass flux because the mass flux is constant. So then, what happens then if we were to sketch, where say, uh, where if like we were to sketch these points on the PV diagram, uh, this would be point uh, CJ. I'll call this point um, I don't know A, or I'll call this point Z and D. Okay, and so what we have here, we have flow coming in at the reactant state. That's state one. It's being shocked up uh, by the shock wave. Uh, that's and basically this point here is called the so-called Z and D spike, because um, traditionally uh, it will look something uh, for explosives. It will look something like this. So it uh, and so this is called a sort of Z and D spike. Uh, there's sort of a classic anvil shape to the structure of a detonation. Uh, this structure here, where there's a flat period, uh, that is uh, common with gases. Uh, where it takes some time, there's some induction time that it takes for the gases to start to react. Even though you've heated them up, it takes some time to break, uh, to basically break the molecules uh, apart. Where for a high uh, uh, explosive, the shock is so strong that the molecules start reacting right away. Okay, and so, uh, and so basically this portion here is called a Z and D spike. And that would be, and since they all lie on the Rayleigh line, and there is no reactions yet, so this is the frozen hegonial. This is the equilibrium hegonial. And I apologize for using different terms for the same thing multiple times, uh, but if you read the literature, you'll see all these different terms being used by different groups, so uh, I'm trying to use as many of them as possible just to uh, get you used to that. Okay, so if we think about this, basically where these points are on the PV diagram, well, 
we, uh, we start from the reactant state, state one, then we're going to be hit, then, then the reactants are going to be whacked by a shock wave, but, the, but there's going to be no reactions immediately behind that shock wave. So basically the state jumps from state one and it jumps over to uh, uh, basically, basically to, uh, it basically jumps to this, uh, uh, basically to the Z and D point uh, 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 on the reactant Hugonia, okay? And so you could think of it as it goes up along the Rayleigh line up to this point here. But again, shocks aren't a smooth process, so, so it basically jumps from here to here. Okay, then we are now at the Z and D point. Now, uh, basically now chemical reactions start to occur. And as the chemical reactions proceed, we start to move down the Rayleigh line until we hit the CJ point. And then at the CJ point, we are at full chemical equilibrium, uh, and we are and we uh, and and we are also at the we are also at the sonic point. Okay, and so you could sort of think of this as um, that you could draw an intermediate Hugonio. Say we'd have the screen one is where it's sort of half reactive. Oops. Okay, and so basically the the entirety of the process would occurs a long uh, 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 a long uh, uh, a long this one Rayleigh line, but it's gonna but it's going to basically across many 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 different hugonios. You just need to define all the different hugonios for all the different partially reacted states. Okay, which is very difficult to do, uh, and so and but. And the only two that are very well defined are the are the frozen or the reacting hugonio, and the product or the equilibrium hugonio. Okay, so are there any questions with that? And so, okay, so that uh, discuss that. And so now the question is is how do we compute the structure uh, between the shock and between the sonic plane? Okay, and so that's what we'll be discussing um, soon. And so now the sonic condition is actually really important is that it asks is that it basically isolates the reaction zone. This here would be the reaction zone. Off. Okay, is it isolates the uh, um, the reaction zone uh, from the outside world. So if we consider a detonation propagating in a channel. Over here, and we have a wall. Uh, we have a wall blocked off here. This detonation that that is propagating this way has no idea that there is a wall there, and this detonation would propagate at the same velocity. Is that basically this structure here would be unchanged if I were to suddenly open up this wall, because it would have no idea. It has no possible way of knowing. Uh, basically, that I did anything behind the uh, behind the, the the detonation. Now, this region here uh, between the wall and the CJ point that is a, an expansion wave in the gas dynamic sense, and it follows the detonation, and it's very commonly called a Taylor wave. Okay. Now, the structure of the Taylor wave is very dependent on the boundary condition here, whether this wall is closed or open, etc. But the structure of the detonation that is producing that flow that has uh, uh, this boundary condition here has no influence on, on it. Okay. And so basically, this CJ point here, it is analogous uh, to rocket to a rocket with a uh, uh, with, uh, basically with a choke, uh, basically with a choke nozzle. So in a rocket, you have a combustion chamber with some rocket propellant here, then it burns in the combustion chamber. Then you use a converging diverging nozzle to accelerate the flow. And at the throat, you have a sonic plane. And so the reason that a rocket burns so stably, at least from external influences, uh, you can have internal things going on inside, which can cause bad days for the rockets, uh, which are very difficult to deal with, by the way. Uh, but anyways, from external sources, um, and uh, a rocket is very robust to external influences. So for instance, if I was to send an acoustic wave into the rocket, uh, because the flow here, 
at the sonic plane is going at the speed of sound, there is no way for uh, uh, for this acoustic information uh, to basically make its way uh, inside of the combustion chamber and then basically alter the combustion process in the rocket. Okay, um, you could argue that well there'll be some boundary layer defects and things like that, and so there are some physical ways to where at least a modicum of acoustic information can sneak its way into the combustion chamber, but those are very, very small and you don't need to worry about those in most applications. So what happens at the sonic plane of a CJ uh, detonation is very analogous to that. And so you could think of the combustion chamber is basically walled off uh, by a shock wave rather than a physical wall. Uh, and, and instead of having a converging diverging nozzle, it accelerate the flow. Uh, the chemical heat release process itself is accelerating the flow. Okay, and so it, in a way they're kind of analogous. Okay, so uh, are there any questions on this? Professor, I just have a, a quick question. Is the, is the Z and D point still a sonic point or is it supersonic? No, that's, uh, that's actually subsonic. It's subsonic. Yep, yeah, because- it Because it's part of the strong or it's, it's a, Okay. Uh, uh, because it's behind the shock wave. Okay, got it. So it, it, it's just behind the shock wave. Okay, and this where, where the that. CJ point is the shock front, then? No, 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 no. The shock point, the shock front and the CJ point are two different points. The shock is, um, if you have flow going into the shock, the shock is right here. And so the, the shock is on the frozen or inert trigonial, okay? And, and the CJ point is the point after the shock that occurs after you, uh, uh, after all the reactants have, com have burned completely. So the Z and D, so the Z and D point is just after the shock, but nothing has but nothing has had time to burn yet. And the CJ point is after the shock, but after everything burned. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, that helps. And so you you the chemical reaction is accelerating the flow from subsonic to sonic. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's yeah, it's just like Rayleigh flow if you've had gas dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and so, um, and so now we want to determine the structure of the detonation. And so we need to look at the governing equations in 1D. And so basically uh, we want to model this structure here. And so really what we have here is we're going to start out with X equal to zero. We know here we have a shock wave. Uh, we can find out how fast the shock wave is going. So the flow is going at DCJ into the shock wave. <clears throat> and so we, you can apply um, uh, you can apply ranking Hugonio to determine uh, this point here at the Z and D spike. So initial condition is frozen in the post-shock state. Um, and I'll explain why. And so in, in the Z and D point determined, by the normal shock relations. Okay, and then, and so we do not need to solve any equations or derive any fancy equations uh, for this part of the detonation structure here, because uh, this here is just the reactant state and this here is the shock wave and you can apply the normal shock relations for that. Well, where you need to derive the equations are to basically uh, determine the structure after the shock wave. Okay, and then the starting point for our differential e equations that we're going to be deriving is just after the shock wave and at the so-called Z and D spike. Okay, and again, that is determined uh, by using just the straight up normal shock relations. If you have an ideal gas, you can use the straight up normal shock relations uh, to determine that point. And so we are going to making, be making some assumptions here. One, we are going to be assuming that the detonation is propagating in, uh, steadily. Uh, there is no wall friction. 
and there's no heat loss. Uh, the detonation will be basically 1D and planar. That is, the shock will be perfectly flat. There will be no curvature to that shock. Uh, we will correct for that um, a, a bit later on uh, using the theory developed by Scott Stewart called detonation shock dynamics, uh, because the curvature of a shock can have a massive influence on how fast it propagates. Uh, and we'll be assuming that the detonation is, is basically propagating into a, a constant area duct. Okay. And also, we are assuming that there are no reactions in the shockwave itself. And so basically what this means is that the species composition at the zine D point is equal to the species composition of the reactants. Okay. And so, uh, and so basically, uh, and so basically the chemical composition is the same here as it is over here. And the reason that we can do this is that a, if you look at the uh, shock relations or the Riemann invariance in gas dynamics, a mass fraction in a multi-species system is a Riemann invariant. So basically what this means is that a shock wave itself does not change the chemical composition. Is it a shock wave itself will leave the chemical composition alone. Okay, and so that means this is not really an assumption but it is that, that the fact that the chemical composition at this point and the chemical, the chemical composition at this point are the same is an exact relationship. Uh, any process that changes the chemical composition, even if it occurs in a nanometer, is due to chemical, is, is due to chemical reactions. The shock wave itself is not changing uh, 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 the chemical composition. Chemical reactions are changing the chemical composition. Okay. And also, we will assume that there is no conduction, mass diffusion, viscosity. And also, we will assume that there is smooth flow uh, behind the shock wave because there's really nothing else going on inside. So the flow has to be smooth. Um, okay, so are there any questions on the assumptions? Okay, so this is all a fairly a straightforward. So we can work with conservation of mass. So again, I got them written out full in full 1D. So we got partial rho, partial T plus partial rho U, partial X is equal to zero. Again, we are 1D planar. Um, and we are in, in, in it's steady, so all time derivative terms get crossed out. And so this implies that basically uh, that the mass flux is constant uh, in the duct, or you can expand this out and say rho du dx plus u e rho dx is equal to zero. And we'll actually be using this form later on. Okay, so we did conservation of mass. Uh, are there any questions with that? It should be the most straightforward uh, one. You guys should have encountered working with that one many times in fluid mechanics and other classes. So there's species mass. Again, in one dimension, we have partial rho yi, which is a mass fraction with respect to time, plus uh, partial rho yi times the bulk velocity, plus the diffusion velocity, uh, partial X, is equal to the rate of chemical reactions. We get, and here we get to cross out uh, the diffusion velocity because we're assuming there's no diffusion fluxes. Uh, and it's steady, so we get to cross out this term here. So what we wind up with is D rho U Y I is equal to the, rate of uh, the mass rate of production. The mass rate of production due to chemical reactions. And so on this term here, we can assume it's smooth. And if it's smooth, we can safely use the product rule here. So I'm going to use the product rule and I'm going to bust this term up into yi partial rho u or, or d rho u dx plus rho u dyi dx. And this here is nothing more than conservation of mass. And I can cross that term out. And so what we are left with is dyi dx is equal to the mass rate of production divided by the mass flux. Again, rho u is a mass flux equals m dot double prime. Uh, or I can define a cap omega dot, uh, uh, which is just the mass rate of production divided by the density. And so basically this just equals cap omega dot over u. Okay, and so, um, and you may be noting here that in this step here, I magically changed the partials into Ds. Uh, and that's because with the, 
spatially this is this is this is only a function of x and i'm crossing out the time derivative here and so now uh all, so our flow variables are now a function of only one variable so i can change the partials into these okay and i'm just going to end with one note here um is that you need to be careful with the references on here uh uh with basically omega and cap omega is that some references will call omega what i call cap omega and so you need to be very 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 careful and to tell which one is which uh look at the species mass uh equation right here uh and basically and basically if there is if if they have omega dot and a row you here then omega dot is the mass rate of uh omega dot is the mass rate of production but if it's missing this row here then then omega dot is is what i refer to as cap omega dot so just be very careful with that is that there is not um detonation comes from is used by by multiple different communities and they have multiple different nomenclatures for the same thing and so you you just need to get used to that is that the high explosives uh world is kind of in their own is kind of in their own little multiverse uh, uh, with the uh, 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 with their nomenclature, and you, and you just got to get used to the fact that there are multiple communities that use the same information, and and they'll and they'll call the same thing uh, uh, with different variables. Uh, okay, and so but just be careful with that uh, if you want to tell. Uh, whether omega dot is a mass rate of production, uh, or uh, or 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 whether it is this term right here, is you need to look for this uh, right there, and then and then that will tell you which one is which. So, are there any questions? Okay.